So hi, uh, I'm Sarah. I am a PhD student um, at the National Oceanography Centre and I am looking at coastal ocean acidification in Belize. But as part of that, I'm working with Socrates um, to look at how pH might change um, within reef sites and then with uh, between reef sites. So today I'm just going to show you some of the data that uh, I've collected as part of my PhD and also some data that has been collected by um, in-country partners in Belize, um, Fiji and Dominica. So you might recognise some of this data. So um, as Socrates has been talking about, the uh, OA platforms can be used to monitor long-term ocean acidification trends, but they can also be used to look at fine-scale detail. And so the aim of what I'm trying to do is see if we can use the platform to examine how pH and oxygen at different coral reef ecosystems might uh, vary. So this leads on to kind of four main questions. We want to know what are the pH and oxygen changes on coral reef? Do we see the same range in pH and oxygen on different reefs um, or between reefs on the same reef but at different sites? And how does the relationship between pH and oxygen vary at these different sites? And can we then relate the changes that we are seeing in pH and oxygen to the ecology of the different sites? So um, all this data was collected using the ocean acidification platforms as has been talked about. And just to recap, they're measuring pH, dissolved oxygen, temperature, and salinity. And we are looking at three different countries sites. So they're all part of the Commonwealth Marine Economies Program. And um, we have a site in Dominica. Um, so Dominica is just here. And then the um, OA platform is deployed uh, fairly near to Soufre. And I actually don't know the exact location of this site. So maybe at the end of the talk, if people from Dominica might be able to point out on Google Earth where this site is exactly, that would be a really great help. And then we have a site in Fiji and um, in the Pacific. And this sensor is deployed just off of Suva, which is the capital city along the barrier reef here. Um, and it's Suva is quite a major port and uh, quite densely populated, so it is experiencing um, more anthropogenic signal at this site. And then finally, we have a Belize sites, and in Belize, we actually have three sites. So the it's the platforms are situated um, so just off of Belize City, um, on the Barrier Reef. Um, so Belize City is here, the Belize River discharges just to the north of Belize City and um, we have different sites here. So the aim in Belize um, was also to compare how the pH and oxygen might vary within a reef. So we're looking at two sites that were measured at the same time, um, the back reef, so the landward side of the reef crest and the fore reef and seeing do we see the same changes in these um, reef sites or is one more heavily influenced by land and one more heavily influenced by the ocean. So you can see here in this figure, this is the back reef site. So this is um, Goffs Key for those of you from Belize. And um, we've got a back reef site and a fore reef site, and they're just under 500 meters apart. Um, and the main difference is that they're either side of the reef crest. And then we've also got data from the long-term monitoring site at English Key, which is just a little bit further south than the um, back reef, fore reef comparison. So initially um, I took the data and um, looked at the time series of data and this is just an example, um, this is from Dominica, and to see if we could identify biofouling at the different sites. Um, and as you can see, um, the biofouling around April 10th, we start to see this increase in amplitude of pH and it just continues to increase and increase throughout the rest of the deployment. But the biofouling is only occurring in the pH sensor. Uh, the pH and oxygen sensors are separate and it's um, organisms getting in and forming their own little micro community within the filter. But because I'm looking at how pH is changing and then how these different um, other parameters might explain the pH, I've just removed all the data from when biofouling starts to occur. And then additionally, I look at the data and see if there's any kind of outlying points where there's suddenly a very high or very low pH or oxygen measurement that's not kind of in the same trend. Something might have gone wrong for that one measurement. 
So the OA platform allows you to um, collect a very high resolution time series. So this is the data from the Belize fore reef and back reef comparison experiment. So we deployed it for nine and a half days. Um, and you can see that we see the pH at both sites. So the purple is the fore reef or the seaward side and the back, pink is the back reef. And you can see we, we have this uh, diurnal cycle in pH. It goes increases during the day, decreases at night. And we can start to uh, then compare this to the oxygen measurements. And again, we see this strong diurnal cycle. Um, and the two sites are tracking fairly well, although there is an offset between the two and there is some differences. And then we can start to relate this to the more physical parameters, the salinity the, and the temperature, which might tell us about how different um, water masses are changing or perhaps like a rainfall event. There was heavy precipitation around here and we see the salinity decreasing. And we can start to look at how these different um, sites can, or different times compare. So when salinity um, is very little change in salinity, we see um, quite a strong cycle in the pH and oxygen, suggesting that the ecosystem is having a strong control on the um, water chemistry. We can then start to compare um, the different countries and the different sites with each other. So this takes, um, for every hour of day measurement that we have, we plot it on a graph and we've got pH along the y-axis and then take the running median of each of these um, hourly measurements or depending on what the um, sampling interval is. And we can see that all five of these sites, we see a diol cycle, but the range of the pH, the pH range of this diol cycle changes um, between these different sites. And in Dominica, we see a lot, well, we can't really see a diol cycle here, but if we change the scale, so that it's more, it's fitting with this data, there is a small diol cycle. So we are seeing the diol cycle in all five sites, but the range of this cycle varies. And again, we can see this in oxygen. We can see a very uh, strong diol cycle in Belize fore reef and back reef. Still seeing it in English key in Fiji, but not so much. Dominica initially doesn't look like much, um, but we are still seeing this diol cycle. Um, throughout the day. So oxygen peaking during the day um, and decreasing at night as respiration uh, consumes oxygen. So then we can start to look at how this pH and oxygen might relate to one another. So um, you can, for a given oxygen measurement, we can uh, estimate pH based on the Redfield ratio, which is a theoretical relationship between carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So for a given amount of um, oxygen, we can predict the carbon that will be produced and this will be the pH. So um, during the day, photosynthesis occurs, uh, CO2 is being uh, consumed and producing oxygen, and this will increase our oxygen throughout the day. And also during the day, uh, respiration occurs, but at night there's only respiration. So oxygen is being consumed and producing CO2. And this CO2 that is increasing and decreasing throughout the day um, will change the pH. So as CO2 increases, it drives this equation to the right. We don't really need to think about um, this whole equation, but just think about if CO2 increases, drives it to the right, hydrogen increases. And as CO2 is consumed during the day, um, as this decreases, it drives the equation to the left and uh, hydrogen decreases to balance it out. And as pH is the negative log of the concentration of hydrogen, more hydrogen uh, means a decreasing pH. So just to kind of recap that, as CO2 increases, hydrogen increases, pH decreases, or CO2 decreases, hydrogen decreases, pH. Um, increases. So we can, um, so as the oxygen is consumed or uh, produced, this changes the CO2 and changes the pH. So we can predict this relationship. Um, and this is the black line here is the relationship for the um, kind of current uh, CO2 concentration in the ocean. And as ocean acidification occurs, this relationship will also change. So we can start to look at how the data that 
who's been collected with the OA platforms varies between um, or how that relates to this relationship. So we can start to think about the slope of this line. So this purple line here shows a bigger change in pH than is predicted from the oxygen measurements. And this blue line is a shallower line. So if we're thinking about this purple line where pH is changing much more than is produced by oxygen, something else has to be changing the pH. And that could be from um, input of low pH water, but it could also be from calcification. So corals and uh, other animals with a skeleton and shell produce calcium carbonate. So the corals produce a calcium carbonate skeleton, um, which during the production of this uh, produces hydrogen ions. So as I've just said, as hydrogen ions increase, pH decreases. So potentially if there is considerable calcification occurring at a site, we would see this decrease in pH without an associated change in oxygen because it is separate from the uh, oxygen respiration photosynthesis changes. So if we start to look at how the data is collected using the OA platforms, how this relates to this relationship. So we have the Belize 4 reef. You can see some of it sits along this line. It sits a bit off. And this um, dashed line here is the best fit line of this data with the associated R squared. So the R squared is kind of like the strength of the relationship between um, pH and oxygen. So the higher the R squared, the closer the relationship between the two. And we can see that there is an, it's a slightly steeper slope than predicted um, with the solid black line. And then we can add in the Belize back reef and we see that um, it kind of just sits in the same place, but offset. And it has a slightly lower R squared, but still um, we're still seeing a strong relationship between the two, pH and oxygen. And then we can look at the Belize English key site. And this um, has a much lower R squared. It's not, there's not very much of a relationship at all between the pH and oxygen here. And then we have the Fiji site. Um, and it's not got quite a strong relationship as the Belize sites, but it is, um, we are seeing this relationship and there's kind of, we can kind of see where the points are loosening the relationship. And finally, we have the Dominica site and there's not really any relationship in Dominica between pH and oxygen. So we kind of looked at how, what the, how we can look at the different um, chemical parameters that we can measure. Uh, with the OA platforms and what this might tell us, but then how does that relate to the different reefs? So um, reef, coral reefs are um, under global threat from multiple parameters, ocean acidification, sea surface warming, nutrient overloading. Um, but we want to be able to see, is there a way to monitor a reef? So how can we relate what we're seeing in the chemistry of the water to the health of the reef? So we can start to look at how the ecosystems between these five different sites may vary. So for an example, we've got um, three pictures from the Belize sites. So we have the Belize Four Reef, the Back Reef and the English Key. And you can kind of see looking at them, there's quite a lot of hard coral in the Four Reef. So we've got this, we've got this bit, this bit, and then we've got some soft coral. Well, in the Belize Back Reef, we have one large uh, hard coral and some of it is bleached, some of it is dead and then quite a lot of soft corals and coral rubble around. And then in this English key site, I don't know if you'll be able to see, but this, there's some sponge, sponge here, and then a lot of macroalgae growing over all of this. So um, the sites are different. And we can use a software called Coral Point Count to um, take a series of images and identify what is the dominant ecosystem at each site. So this figure here is for the four Caribbean sites. Um, we've got the four reef, the back reef and the in, in English Key in Belize and then Dominica. And then we've got the proportion of the different, um, like what's the benthic system on that have been identified. So the purple is hard coral and this pinky red is soft coral. And you can see that the hard coral cover is quite distinctly different at the four different sites. 
and there's over 50% is hard and soft coral in Belize for a reef compared to nearly over 50% is either rock or dead coral in Dominica. So this sandy color kind of represents sand, rock and rubble, and this gray is um, dead coral. So we can see that there is quite a variation between the different sites. So Belize for reef is dominated by hard and soft coral, the back reef kind of by sand and soft coral, um, English Key by macroalgae and soft coral, and Dominica is dominated by rock, dead coral. And then in Dominica, we see encrusting coral and sponges and algae starting to grow over this rock um, and dead coral. And it's also worth noting that some of this data was taken only six months after a hurricane, a very large hurricane hit Dominica. So a lot of that, what would have been living on these reefs would have been wiped out by the hurricane. So we can see that each of these um, sites that we have deployed the sensors at are quite different ecosystems, or they're similar, um, but they have different dominant species. So we can then think, how can we relate this dominant, how can we relate this like hard coral cover, for example, to the uh, water chemistry parameters? So as you remember earlier, I showed this um, dial cycle in pH at the five different sites. And you can see that the amplitude or the range of the median pH, so this black line, so it takes away the outliers, um, varies between the two sites, the five sites. So Belize has a larger range than Dominica or Fiji. So if we take this range in pH um, and relate it to percentage hard coral cover, we can see that as coral cover increases, so does the pH range. So we see a bigger cycle um, in the average or the median pH range from these sites when there's more hard coral. And the same is also true for oxygen. So hard coral cover increases, and um, so does the um, oxygen range and oxygen measurements. Um, and this black line is just the best fit line between these four points. Now it is only four points, and maybe other if we had more data, we would see changes in this line, but it does give us an idea of how um, we can relate what we're seeing in the um, sensor data to kind of the health of the coral reef and potential monitoring of a coral reef. We can then um, think about this relationship between pH and oxygen. So these are the two kind of either ends of the measurements we've got. So the Belize 4 reef, um, where we saw this strong relationship between pH and oxygen versus Dominica, where there was basically no relationship between pH and oxygen. You could uh, quite easily draw that line in different directions. Um, so this is kind of looking at the strength of the relationship between pH and oxygen um, versus hard coral cover. So um, we've got hard coral cover along the x-axis and the R squared, which is simply the strength of the relationship. And then we can see that as hard coral cover increases, so does the relationship between oxygen and pH, which is closer to one, the stronger the relationship. So it starts to give us an idea of how we might use this um, platform to not only monitor ocean acidification, but if it was in a reef site to monitor um, a reef environment. And while it's harder to compare between the different sites, if you were, measuring the same site um, every day, or not every day, sorry, like um, month annually at the same month or something, you might see a shift in this relationship between pH and oxygen, which may be able to tell us that the uh, reef is degrading over time. So that was kind of just a brief um, tour of what some of the th things you can start to identify with these ocean acidification uh, monitoring platforms that's not just monitoring of ocean acidification. Um, and just to kind of conclude the benefits, the other benefits of the OA platform is that it enables collection of very high resolution time series data. And that 
the being able to collect oxygen temperature and salinity measurements alongside pH really helps us to explain the changes in pH. We know we can identify if there's um, the pH peak, like decreases suddenly, but it maybe increases or relates to a decrease in temperature that there's some cold water coming in, things like that, or um, the oxygen pH relationship showing the ecosystem control. We can identify dial changes in pH and oxygen and show that the amplitude or range of pH and oxygen um, varies between different reefs and within a reef as well. We saw the difference between the different Belize sites. Um, we can also relate this pH and oxygen range to the reef ecology with ha more hard coral increasing the pH range. And finally, we can look at the relationships between pH and oxygen and identify differences between reefs. So I've just shown us that we can look at the strength of the relationship between pH and oxygen with the ecology um, and perhaps hard coral cover um, strengthens the relationship between pH and oxygen. And when, so when corals dominate, there is in, appears to be a stronger relationship between pH and oxygen. So that's um, everything I have. If you have any questions, I would be love to answer them. Um, or, and also um, if people from Dominica, we can identify where this platform is, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks for that, Sarah. That was really, really interesting. Uh, so if anyone has a question, you can raise your hand or put it in the chat. Uh, while you're thinking of some, I've got a question, Sarah. I wondered if maybe you could tell us more about this software that you've used to identify the different types of coral. Like, what do you need to feed into this program? Is it free? Because this could potentially be something really useful to a lot of the people listening in to the presentation right now. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so it's a free software. It's called Coral Point Count. Um, I can just, I can share my screen if I just quickly. And actually, I only learned, taught myself to use this a couple of weeks ago. Um, basically, you load an image and you um, it randomly distributes points onto this image and you identify them um, depending on what you're looking for. So I identified them based on like hard coral, soft coral, sand, rubble. Um, but you can also identify down to species level if you wanted to do that. Um, let me just see. I think if I share, okay, you should, I think you can see that now. So yeah, yeah, that's on. This is the software and this is an image from Dominica and um, taken with an ROV. And um, ideally you want a photo that's facing downwards so you don't have the C in the background. And then I've told it to randomly distribute um, 56 points in an eight by eight grid. And then I go through and I, it highlights it. Um, sometimes I can't identify it. It's, so for example, it's, oh, it's not, it doesn't want to, if I select you, you can easily see that's a sponge. And then I just put in my um, identifier that I have created. It also comes with a, um, you can use the one that it comes with because I wanted specific things, hard coral, soft coral. I've, set um, the identifiers that I want. And then it, you save it and it produces an Excel sheet with the proportions or the number of points that you've identified. So I did that for four images on each of the Belize sites and 12 images on each of, on the Dominica site, and just to kind of get a general idea of what the ecology is on each of those sites. That's really cool. I think that's gonna be really handy like to couple with other measurements of other essential ocean variables, it's really going to give you a, an ecosystem perspective on what's going on. Yeah, definitely. A request in the chat if you can uh, post the link to access the software. Yes, I will do that. 
Um, I'll need to find it. <laughs> um, can I ask, is it um, Diana and Derek? Are they, are you on this call? Yeah, Diana's asking for the link. <laughs> oh, she's asking for the link. Yeah, uh, just, and can you, are you able to point out to me where the um, site is if I share my screen? Ah, sure, sure. I can give you the approximate area. Yeah, that would be, okay. So can you, wait, is it? Uh, Sharing Google Earth now. Yeah. So, um, Derek, are you able to? Is it? Is it somewhere around here? Yeah, it's somewhere around where you are. Um, I think you need to go a bit, a bit more north. Yeah, I think it's somewhere about there, you know. About there. Okay. Yeah, am I am I am I hot or cold? <laughs> I'm I trying to wonder where what look where is champagne? Where is champagne on that um on that map? I think champagne it's is, about the here. Point is, yeah, that's that's the point going to champagne. Yeah. Where's on the other side of this point? About there. You see the road, right? That's the road up there. And this point, that's point you know there. So champagne is beyond that point. So normally we would swim from champagne to go on this side or whatever. Um, so it's somewhere in this area there, but a bit further out. It's a bit further out to see. Like you yeah, have somewhere possibly around here. The general, okay. general location. That's correct. Um, location from, um, from Simon, but I'm able to You're breaking up, Diana. Can you say that again? Oh, yes, I said I was trying to get the GPS location from Simon because he's mm -hmm. um, probably the one that have the GPS location, the exact location of where it, where it was yeah. located. Um, but I haven't been able to get that from him as yet, but I'll try again sometime. That would be really amazing, Diana. So the software you're showing earlier um, is something you can use just from pictures you take with a GoPro when you go snorkeling. Yeah, so all of these pictures uh, are taken with a GoPro that I use. And even mm. the one that I loaded that was taken with an ROV um, is actually got a GoPro attached to the ROV because the GoPro takes better pictures than the ROV does. Yeah. So yeah. The ones I used for the Belize site, I took them all with a GoPro snorkeling um, or diving. So it is, yeah. It just needs to be um, good enough resolution that you can identify. Yeah. Diana and, and Derek, you, you guys acquired um, a, a mini um, ROV, I think, recently from uh, Germany. Does that have a capability to take pictures? Images? Yeah. Yes. All right. Body. Body. <laughs> yes, it can take pictures, but as I was just listening to Sarah there saying that she put on um a GoPro because the GoPro takes better pictures. That is something we might have to look at because um the last time we used the um the ROV in a pool, it was it was bright outside, it was clear, but I still find the the video footage wasn't so somewhat so clear. So maybe I'd have to get a GoPro as well to attach to it when you're going to use it out at or something like that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's yeah, um, I, the spray moisture in the in the in the um, housing. So we might have to just deal with the moisture in the housing up there. Uh, okay. So with the Dominica footage actually, so the Belize one I just took still photos because I was um snorkeling and things, but it's on a video. The GoPro's recording a video and then I watch the video and I take screen grabs from the video that then I put into here. Um the quality is not maybe 
quite as good as if it was just a direct photo, but it's also the only way you can really do it if you're sending something down. So I think this, this, is, this is a nice um, addition uh, to the autonomous chemical data that you're collecting with the ocean acidification kit. If you have a record of what the site looks like as well, um, and compare pictures between different years or so on, then, then I'll make a nice contextual information of you know, how things are changing. I have a question for you, Sarah. Um, so I guess your data could show that, you know, if, if uh, hard coral cover changes over time, perhaps you can see that in the, in the chemistry data. What do you think it would look like if it changed from uh, like a coral dominated site to a, a macroalgae dominated site? So I think um, that's kind of a good comparison from the Belize uh, four reef back reef. They're more coral dominated and um, they're a little bit more protected, I think, because of their proximity to Goff's Key. But I'm just going to share this again um, but the English key site um, has a lot more macroalgae in it so I think that's kind of a good indicator of moving from four reef to back uh, English key this shift from hard coral to macroalgae um, and we do see that the relationship breaks down in this site so the this purple line here is the back uh, four reef and this pinky purple line is the English key and we're not the relate there's very little relationship between uh, r squared of 0.3 is not strong at all and um, so I think you just you see this breakdown in the relationship between the two you would also I can't I'm not just from thinking about it, not from, I can't show it with this data, you would expect um, if there was still a relationship for it to follow this line better because um, when macroalgae is dominating, there's not calcification occurring, which can also decrease pH. The macroalgae is photosynthesizing and respiring and should um, kind of follow the theoretical relationship. I don't think we have a site that isn't enough macroalgae dominated to yeah. show this. It would be interesting to put the sensor in a seagrass bed because that's and see if it then follows this theoretical relationship because seagrass should kind of respire and um, photosynthesize and theoretically yeah. along this line. Yes, that would definitely be interesting to, uh, to look into uh, different environments different relationships. Great, thank you. There's some questions in the chat. Um, I've lost the chat. Um, so there's one from Sean, it looks good. I can see where it will be, well, we will reduce processing time. He's talking about the software. I'm concerned about the ROV. I'm currently pushing from organization to obtain one. Any recommendation for spec I should be looking for, especially for the camera? Uh, so that is a question that I can't really answer. Um, I see that Tim Laba is on this call. He might have a better idea because he was actually the one deploying the ROV in Dominica. Um, but I think from I for the Belize sites, I used a GoPro Hero 3 and it collected good enough images. Yeah, for, the, for the Dominica site, we have some GoPro for that area, I think. We also have good bathymetry for the Champagne area. 
Um, yeah. Not exactly sure. I got, I'd have to put my get, get, get the data out to know what um, deep tracker information we've got there. And it would have probably have had the GoPro attached to it as well. That'd be the GoPro Hero Four. Um, yeah. So we, we 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 could have some data from that. Yeah. So this is the GoPro Hero Four video footage from that. Um, but you found right that the. It, the ROV needed this additional GoPro to be attached. Yeah, the little, the, yeah, the, the, the deep tracker, little ROV, the, the video on that was not of, of high enough quality. So that was, we, we always put on a, a GoPro on there as well, which was really good quality. Yes, I was just trying to dig some of that data out to have a look at it. Because where you, I don't know where you put your ocean certification piece of kit, but where you pointed to, that was not um, champagne brief. No. No. So, a bit further um, south. Around yeah. the corner. Yeah. Okay, fine. So I've got I've got good bathymetry for most of that area and backscatter. So it's sort of um, uh, depending on how deep you put it. Yeah. So that's um, something we're still trying to figure out. <laughs> well if you if you know where you put it, I can tell you how deep it is. Okay. Vice versa. That, oh that would be really useful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Okay, I have a question about um, Champagne Reef. Isn't that an area that has um, underground seeps um, bubbling up? So that's why it's called Champagne Reefs. And wouldn't that probably account for the difference in the data that you have received that is, as it compares to the other sites? So, um, I did wonder that at first, but it's not that close to Champagne Reef. In, um, and because I did kind of think it, before I looked at this data that maybe the Dominica site would have a lower pH compared to the other ones, um, but actually it doesn't. And I just don't think that it's close enough to Champagne Reef to have, be having a for it to have an influence on it, or you know, the water's not coming down from Champagne Reef and reaching that um, the site where it's at. It would be interesting to see how it compared at Champagne Reef, um, but no, I don't think this is having an influence. I think overall that um, that region is uh, affected by um, volcanic. Um, springs and, and more acidic um, uh, water runoff. Uh, so overall, perhaps um, pH might be lower than other locations that we've looked at, but there wasn't any direct influence, to, um, you know, the, the uh, short-term variability that, we, that we've seen. We're too far from, from Champagne Reef for any uh, sources of CO2. And there was a question to me from Derek about the methodology for the pictures, but I think that was, we answered, you answered that already. Yeah, so I guess it's, um, we have gone back and looked at pictures that I, most of the pictures I took in Belize were, you know, of the deployment and um, often for social media to kind of show what we were doing. And it's been a bit of a learning experience to think actually when you deploy these, if you can take pictures at the same time, it can really help to explain the data that we're seeing um, and trying to take kind of with thinking about the ecology um, at the time of deployment as opposed to thinking about it a bit later especially when you're in the UK and you can't look at the site again. Um, can I just make a comment on the um, photographic techniques? Um, there are several, the uh, monitoring of the coral reefs using photography or videography 
is something that has been developed over the last like, 20 years. And here in Jamaica, um, we use these photo quadrats to measure um, reef composition. So we have a number of sites that we monitor using photographic techniques. We use st a still camera though, and we take, we run a transect and we take um, photographs at intervals and we use the CPCE to do the analysis of the of the benthic cover. So it's, it's a well-established um, protocol for doing benthic assessment. Uh, it's a lot easier than some of the previous protocols which required you to run a transect and actually record underwater what was at each point along the transect. But you know, there are some guidelines that are associated with how you take the picture and intervals and so on. So, but it's a well-established um, technique for benthic cover. Yeah, that, yeah, that's great to hear that you're using it. Yeah, and it is a well-established technique, um, which is why, and I think it's a fairly straightforward, from what I've found so far, a fairly straightforward technique and a lot easier um, having done in, person surveys of a reef is a lot easier using a um, the CPC with the photographics um, to look at the changes along a reef. I have a question for everyone, perhaps um, more of an ignorant question. I mean, we talked a lot about collecting um, pH data and uh, establishing a, a long-term ocean acidification data set. But we're also collecting temperature data, which is very relevant and very uh, important for uh, tropical environments and, and you know the whole ocean environment in general. But I'm wondering if, um, if there has been in the past uh, a practice of uh, of using long term temperature data sets uh, to i guess assess ecosystem health or perhaps um, fisheries f fishing uh, fish catches or, or anything like that in the past does anyone know I don't know, Socrates, can you please repeat? Yeah, we can hear you. He asked if you can repeat the question. Oh, sorry, Derek. Sorry. <laughs> I guess I can't hear you that well. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so have you, I know you guys work for the, for the fisheries um, department and you do record uh, things like uh, fish catch and and things like that, uh, but is there? Have you ever uh, looked into how those uh, that data correlates with environmental data, for example, temperature records, if there are any temperature records? Um, sparingly, um, usually this is done at the regional levels. Um, usually at the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Mechanism um, scientific meetings, which they used to have back in the day. We would look at the um, ecosystem data, um, environmental data, um, in order to try to try and understand um, the stocks, the fish stocks, you know, and then what's what's yeah. happening with them and what's affecting them. So that at that level, usually it would happen. Do you think there's going to be an advantage of having more local uh, records of uh, temperature data, or even oxygen or salinity? I don't know. Um, I can speak for um, Jamaica. I, um, we have or the National Environment and Planning Agency, which is a government agency responsible for the environment. I know have distributed around the island a number of hobo term meters to record temperature on the reefs. Of course, some of the data sets are not continuous but at least it gives you some idea of the of of the temperature 
actually on the reef. Other than that, we use the, you know, NOAA has the satellite derived temperature data. Fortunately, theirs goes back to like 1985. So you can get a, a time series of um, satellite data virtual uh, at a virtual site um, in Jamaica. But I know that NEPA has been working on trying to get, you know, a real in-situ temperature data from a number of locations around the island. That's interesting. So do you think the um, satellite data then is enough for this kind of work? Or do you think there's an advantage of having those hobo sensors and getting some localized temperature? Well, clearly the localized data is better. Um, what, what happens is that sometimes you don't always have, for some reason, the instruments go down. You know, you don't have a long time series of data at the various yeah. locations. So I think that the, the, the NOAA data is kind of like a, a backup or a proxy when you can't get the actual data, but of course the actual data would be, is, is better. Yeah. And is there, is there a correlation between temperature and, and fish stock, for example? Oh, I, I'm not, I don't do fish, I do coral. <laughs> so, um, there is a correlation between um, increased sea surface temperature and coral bleaching, yeah. but I'm, I don't do the fish stock. I'm not a fish fish person. Yeah, okay, great. Any other questions, anyone? Yeah, there's a comment in the chat from St. Vincent. They also collect temperature data. But for those of you that are collecting that kind of data, do you upload it to any repositories like the Coral Reef Monitoring Network, or do you use it all for work in-house? Um, about the GCRMN Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network, um, <laughs> yeah, we, the, the Caribbean has formed um, or reformed themselves and come together to form the GCRMN Caribbean. And part of what we have done to date prior to COVID is that we had have come up with um, protocols for measuring corals and um, protocols for also socioeconomic assessment related to areas that have coral reef. The other thing that we have been working on is some sort of data repository, um, maybe central for the Caribbean, at least data repository, where persons who are using the protocol can update their data, upload their data. Um, but we really haven't progressed with that because our last meeting was in January of last year, just prior to the um, COVID. And so we, we haven't made progress, but it's one of the things that we hope to do in terms of pulling all the data that is collected under this umbrella um, for, for the region um, to, to be able to have access to. That sounds amazing. I have a question from St. Vincent. Um, I'm trying to understand, like I was trying to follow this conversation. Um, how much of a time scale does it take to see a variation in ocean acidification? Ocean acidification. Is it can be measured like on a like a seasonal, uh, like does it change from season to season? Like um, in relation to a specific, um, like like with tourism season, but increased traffic, would we see increased acidification, or would would something like that be measurable? Or is this more of a long term, like over the span of years, where the factors might be more like agriculture production or something like that? Um, if that's even measurable. Uh, 
That's a, that's a good question. Um, and because we measure pH in, in these coastal dynamic ecosystems, we're seeing um, daily variability that can be up to 0 0.1 pH units, sometimes even more in, in some environments. So this is by far the most dominant process that is gonna drive the pH. Um, if you wanna see some variability or an effect from an external factor that 